Good evening, everyone. Today is November 9th, 2021, and it's seven o'clock. And I would like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Let's go ahead and get started with agenda item 1.2, flag salute. So we can all head it, uh, stand up. Moving on to item 1.3, roll call. We have board member Cruz Gonzalez. Present. We have board member Rodriguez Pena. Here. Board member Bo. Here. And board member Greer. That is not on yet. He sent a message that he is troubleshooting uh, the internet. And so he's hoping to be on soon. Okay, awesome. And I, um, board member Ariannis is here. Now, please get a motion to move 2.1, the approval of our agenda for today. I make a motion to approve 2.1. By second. We have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena, a second by board member Bo. So we can go ahead and cast our vote. I'm not logged in yet, so we we'll to... go ahead. And do, we'll do a roll call. We have board member Cruz Gonzalez, since we have you online. Yes. Board member Rodriguez Pena. Yes. Board member Bo. Yes. And I myself. Yes. We have four yeses and one absent at this time. Go ahead and move forward with our agenda for tonight. And at this time, uh, since we're moving on to 3.1 public comment on agenda or non-agenda items, I would like to remind everyone, les quiero recordar que tenemos traducción para esta, esta junta que tenemos ahora, um, que va a ser muy importante. So the translation services are available to the public and they're available through, through Zoom. Do we have anybody online that would like to speak? Lika? Uh, yes, we have Melissa Wilson Perkins with her hand raised. Hi, um, good evening board, superintendent and cabinet. Uh, I wanted to call in tonight to talk about TK8s in our district. Um, <clears throat> when the reorg reorganization committee voted by a narrow margin to include a TK and model three, uh, all Model 3 variations proposed were required to select a location for a TK-8 in our district. Um, I, I don't believe that the reorganization committee spent enough time on this issue and any nominations for a TK-8 um, locations besides Ellington that, that we made were, were not fully informed as necessary data points like the cost of updating campuses for adding um, additional grade levels was not discussed. As a parent member on the team, I, I apologize for not asking more um, site-specific information regarding this issue. Um, I believe that more information about community desire for a TK-8 in our changing district, site engagement and potential costs still need to be taken into consideration to determine potential TK-8 locations. Uh, <clears throat> also, please consider that if a TK-8 in our district has value in giving parents choice, then a wall-to-wall -wall language school is actually doing the exact opposite. It forces parents with their children enrolled in our dual immersion program to choose the TK-8 or leave the program and doesn't allow non-DI um, parents to opt into this TK-8 school because their students would be years behind the target language. Lastly, um, as we can see from some of the hypothetical Model 3s presented by the superintendent's team, um, two TK-8s in our district would drain our middle school population. Two TK-8s starts our district's middle school campus 
well below um, our district's desired capacity goals. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Perkins. Do we have anybody else online that would like to speak? We have no other hands raised at this time. Thank you. Since there is no more public comment, we'll go ahead and move on to the general function of this meeting, which is item 4.1, school reorganization. Go ahead and hand it over to Kevin. Thank you, Board President. I uh, just want to walk, wanna walk uh, through uh, some of the uh, attachments um, that are in uh, today's uh, board agenda um, and explain uh, what they are and why they are. Uh, so for the first attachment is the attachment uh, that you had uh, at last week's um, school reorganization meeting. Uh, there is a, uh, a small change in the uh, PYP MYP area, uh, just to add for transparency and clarification. Uh, we did put there uh, that um, let me see where we put that at. Um, hmm? No, let me, we'll, we'll look for that in a quick second um, to see where, where that landed. Uh, but we were going to put there that um, the uh, cost for an IB coordinator in the MYP PYP uh, can be uh, taken over uh, duties from it, uh, possibly existing uh, staff. We also put the 10-year capacity and enrollment. Uh, that was a request. Uh, we did uh, change it, the formatting around a little bit, just so it's a little bit larger, uh, but that does cover obviously more pages. Uh, again, we've seen this before. This is just a different format uh, to, uh, to allow for a larger uh, font. Uh, there was also a request uh, to have a map of our schools uh, that denote uh, the enrollment and the capacity or current enrollment or capacity of schools. And so here you see uh, a map uh, with the school sites, uh, red line uh, to the school site, E is for enrollment, and C is for uh, capacity. So just a different way of looking at it. This is on a map versus on a, in a table. Can do I ask a question regarding? Yes, yes ma'am. Sorry, before before we want, do we do we have this for our our viewers to also look at? It's attached to the board agenda item. Um, we can put it up if you prefer. Just just so when we talk about it, they, they can they can see what, what we're talking about. Sure. Um, do you want to uh, put it up, Hope? Uh, there was a question about the map. Yeah, the question is regarding the enrollment. Does um, that include if it's gonna we're gonna remove the sixth graders? Does this enrollment include the sixth graders or not? This enrollment. I'm sorry. So this enrollment, Miss uh, Yolanda, includes this is current year's projected enrollment. So this is not based on the school reorganization or the plan. This is the actual projected enrollment for 21-22 school year. So to include the grades that are at the schools currently right now. So we have the TK6, um, Ellington, the TK8, the high schools, and then the middle schools are seven and eight. Okay, but I thought that we we wanted to see what um what would it look like if there's not sixth graders, you know, you know, the um the kinder to fifth grade, right? You know, if if what would the schools look like then? Then I apologize, not, not I misunderstood enrollment now. Okay, I misunderstood the request. I can get that for you. Oh, thank okay. you. Can I just clarify, make sure I understand? So we're going to do the same thing. You would like to see this with PK-5 and then 6 through 8 at the middle school? Please. And am I determining, I'm utilizing the schools that's on here, and then do I leave the schools that are scheduled to close blank? Yes. Okay, got it. Uh -huh.
I'm going to the uh, share so I can put that I can put that up. See if that works. That's not letting me share. Give me a second. Uh, Lika, do you know if that's a setting? It's not letting, it's not allowing me to share. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, the next um, attachment, uh, this was uh, a so a couple of uh, requests in this attachment. Uh, so we had a request <clears throat> to see what it would look like if um, Allington TK8 uh, were to remain open. And so on this first one here, this is adding uh, Allington TK8 as the one TK8. So you will notice that Valleydale is no longer a TK8, it's a TK5. The second page. If we insert Allington TK8 here, Allington is on the southern tip of the district. And so we kept Valleydale as a TK5 instead of having two neighboring uh, schools as a TK8. And we made Hodge the TK8. Again, that is not a, for no other reason that it was the more the most northern school. That's, that's the only criteria uh, there. So what is the difference between um, Hodge and Dalton of the distance? Um, not, not major, but if you look at the, at the map here, uh, Hodge is the most northern, followed by uh, Longfellow and, and Dalton. So I don't think it's much northern, yeah, but just, much. A, just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the third... Uh, the third graphic here was uh, the request to see what it would look like if the uh, high schools were flipped. Uh, so in other words, uh, Gladstone High School became the one high school and Azusa High School became the one uh, six, eight. And so this one is one TK eight with Gladstone High School being the high school. And then the last one, is two TK8s with Gladstone High School uh, being the high school. Uh, again, these are just trying to capture some of the thoughts. Um, in no way, shape, or form is this a, um, you know, what, what we are suggesting to, to do. These are just trying to capture the thoughts and the requests just to give different views as the conversation begins. Those were the attachments. So I turn it, Board President, I turn it back to the Board of Education. Do any of you guys have any questions? The conversation. I, I do. Yeah. I, I just want to know. Um, so I, I wanted to know that are, are we going to be talking about the schools? In what order are we talking about the schools? the programs, the budget. I think that, you know, speaking about the schools is more important because we need to set our foundation to know what are we going to put in this school? I mean, you build a house, you build a foundation, then you work up. Um, I, I just think it's important that we just need to, you know, rip that bandage and just, just do it. We just have to decide because we only have two more meetings to go and we're supposed to decide on what is the vote about the, the schools or the programs or, you know? So if it's about the schools, we only have two more meetings, special meetings to decide that. And then we can go forward. I just think that we just keep going in circles. Just like we're talking about this. Okay, fine. We spoke about this. And then what? So I, I just think that we need to 
um, strategize in phases, step one, two, three, and then know where we're going from there. Board Member Bo. Thank you, Board Member Burgess Pena. I, um, I share your sentiment around finding a landing, starting with a starting point, because um, we've got to start somewhere. However, um, I'd like to begin our conversation with program so that we can better understand the costs of our current programs, the cost of any future programs that we've discussed or any other programs we might want to implement. And then really, I have a couple of questions around um, the demand for programs, enrollment at our current programs, and what our stakeholders, what our parents out in community have said about what they want to see. So that maybe we can start with who's in our programs now and what have their what has our parent and community said about what they want to see to get a sense of how many seats we need to make available for any particular program. No, I, I understand that, but I still say, you know, you you just hypothetically, you know, you're you're gonna we're talking about 10 programs, 15 programs. I, I don't know. And then maybe we'll end up with five schools. So we're going to waste most of the time speaking about programs and we don't even know what we're going to put in these schools. No, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I, I still feel that we need to know where we're going to put these programs. So I have a, a question maybe you can kind of kick off some of this. Um, so Mr. Ortega, can you tell us how many students we currently have in dual immersion? We talked about dual immersion as a program that's growing, a program that we'd like to expand. So how many students are currently enrolled? And is it accurate that our oldest students are in fourth grade or our oldest students are in fifth grade? Um, so off the top of our heads, I'm not sure that we have uh, the number uh, of, of enrolled students in dual immersion. I'm going to look to uh, Dana to see if... Clarifying question, just clarifying uh, board member both. Um, did you mean dual immersion at Hodge or bo at both schools in um, in the whole program? Uh, my my first question is uh, district wide. District -wide. So how, total, how many students, how many elementary students we have in dual immersion? Okay, so something well, that we can retrieve share. from, I think, from Aries. Got, I think Dana got the number for us. Yep. Um, I just uh, referencing the presentation that we did um, a few weeks ago. We have four hundred and thirty nine students in PK through fifth grade. And if nothing changed, where would the fifth graders matriculate to, to continue in dual immersion for middle school if nothing changed? So if nothing changed, they would remain where they're at right now uh, for sixth grade. And then after sixth grade, uh, the original intent was that they would uh, matriculate to Slauson. And there they actually would take Spanish for zero period. So we actually would uh, look to build out uh, a, a dual immersion middle school program uh, that would potentially have them taking two of their six periods in Spanish. Uh, one of those courses would be Spanish language arts, and then another course would be a content area, uh, for example, social studies uh, or science. So would that follow the 60-40 model for middle school? And that would be starting in the seventh grade? Yes, it would. So back about four years ago, I know that you guys had a zero period for these individuals. And they actually did take um, Spanish uh, language arts and social sciences. The reason I know is my daughter was in it. Okay. So um, she took it her sixth, seventh, and this one, sixth graders are still in middle school. It was sixth, seventh, and eighth. And uh, now she's at the high school and is taking the Spanish uh, for the last three years and will take her final year to get that. It's, I think it's really important to, to also let the parents know when they're coming into dual immersion that, you know, we have the um, seal of biliteracy that these students can actually look forward to, right? And being able to um, kind of piggyback back off um, uh, board member Bo, being able to lay it out but I think we, you know, now coming back to, to what uh, board member Rodriguez Pena was saying, I think regardless of what school it is at, 
the programs are sustainable and they will be sustainable regardless of, of what programs we decide to keep, what programs we decide to bring. I think it, it's really more, more important as well. I would have to agree with board member Rodriguez-Pena. We have to be able to, we've decided already model three, but the community already knows it's model three, it's one high school. I mean, that's, you know, we're trying to be as transparent as, as possible. But I, but I feel like we're kind of dancing around this school, yes, no, not that school, or maybe that school, you know. And and in reality, one of the things that we we are voting on, I mean, this time around, I think we learned from the last time, right, from the last two schools that 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 we closed, which was Gladstone Street School and Mountain View, was that we didn't talk about programs, we didn't talk about you know these things that we're in, you know, in very in, in detail. And so I'm grateful to have this conversation, um, you know, to be able to, but I think it is important that we decide what school, right? That we have that hard conversation, you know, looking at the school um, capacity, what, what makes sense? One in the out, you know, one in the North, one in the South, on the sides. I mean, one of the things that, um, I mean, I don't have it in front of me that I had, um, was uh, I'm the one that brought up the, the, the two TK8s. And, um, you know, let, let me ask, w will that have an impact in our one mega middle school if we have the two tk eight? See, okay, yeah. So maybe that's not a good idea, right? Okay, so I don't know, what do my colleagues think? We can start there. So, so you're saying that the if you do um, six, seven, and eight, that it, it would have an impact on the elementary schools. Is that what you're saying? Oh no, I'm saying right. that if we had um, two TK through eight. Oh, right. Um, the impact of the, the impact. Uh, seventh and eighth graders going into yes. the mega school. Oh, okay. Yeah, Under oh. yeah. So that would so. have an impact, and so. Yeah. You know, maybe we'll that's one thing we can decide things. tonight yeah, is we do right. It we're looking at because there's a lot of information in front of us, a lot, and I can I I can I can relate to what you both are saying, right? Like there's just so much information that we need to get through, that we need to decide, that we need to dialogue, and we need to have these hard conversations and be able to um, dialogue on on these topics and be able to rip off the bandaid and let let's talk about schools, let's talk about Right, because the programs they're going to be sustainable, right? We're going to try to Dana, I'm looking at you, <laughs> right? Programs we're, we're going to make sure, right? If we bring, right? If we bring, um, we're looking at the uh, what is that program? Um, the um, what is it? The YM M one YMP the IB program for yeah. middle years and primary. Right, years. you know, if we're looking Quite to good. explore, we've never had it, right? Yeah. Um, I mean that that's it, but if we can. Talk about the TK through eights right now. Um, board member Sh uh, Janeline Cruz Gonzalez, did you have anything to say? I haven't seen your hand raised. Just want to double check. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think, I, I would ask Sabrina. I think she, you were asking questions for a particular reason. I didn't really hear why you were asking about the dual enro immersion enrollment. Sure, I, I want to get a sense of the pipeline, right, and understand that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm of the philosophy that we can't offer every choice and do it all well. So by narrowing down our choices, and I've been calling them bounded choices, let's say we offer five things and we do that and we realign our resources to do each of those five things really well. If arts, so let's say, right, start, Yolanda, start ripping off the mandate. If it's art, IB, STEM, and dual immersion, right, that's four things. Um, where are our kids now in the district? What's the pipeline? So what's the pipeline for IB? A primary years program at an elementary, a middle years program at the, the super middle school, and then continuing on with IB track at our high school. Similarly for dual immersion, where are our kids now, right? So I heard you say, Ms. Ortega, 439 students TK5. And then at this point, we've identified what the middle school program would look like. Right. So, and board uh, president, you talked about, you referenced the seal of biliteracy. 
right? So if that's the goal, if the goal is to provide an articulated pathway for our students to be able to earn the seal of biliteracy, how do we get there, right? So what do we need to change or ensure we have for middle school? So those families that make the commitment early to sign up for dual immersion in TK or kindergarten, they go to a school, they experience the elementary program. What are we setting up for middle school? And then how will that carry on through high school? And so on this um, model three with one TK Ellington, this first page, where it says Gladstone, if um, the middle school is uh, located at Gladstone High School, six through eight, DI and MYP. Um, Dr. Mitchell, can you talk to me about how we can offer dual immersion and MYP on one campus? I don't have specific information on that. I can get that for you. I don't see why that's something we could not offer. Um, I'm, I, you can do classes in um, in you know a, a a primary language, right? You can do the coursework for um, for this, uh, you know, in in Spanish. Um, the dual or the MYP program does have a language component, um, so I mean we could definitely look at exploring. I I haven't seen that. I don't know if you have seen that, Mr. Ortega. No, but like you're saying. Uh... So the dual immersion students, uh, if they opted to remain in the program, <clears throat> having experience, we do have um, uh, students who do fall out at that point in time because other interests um, get born, right? And it peaks. They, they want to try something different. And so just like every other in the master schedule, there would be a, again, as an example, a science course. And that science course would just happen to be taught in uh, in Spanish. Um, and then their elective would be SLA or a Spanish uh, language arts course, uh, as an example. And I don't think that uh, takes away or strips away from the AY, uh, MYP philosophy um, that the, the school would live and breathe in whether you're in the dual immersion classes or not. Thank you. I think because I, I was excited to see the double asterisk on this with the six through eight super middle school at Gladstone High School. At our last meeting, we talked about the idea of having the middle school, our single middle school be the, MY, the IB and middle years program. Okay, that offers world language. It continues a strong humanities program. It prepares students, um, maybe better prepare students for the rigors of high school. And so getting, um, Board Member Cruz and Celeste, getting back to your point about What's the pathway for the dual immersion? Is it still called dual immersion in, under the MYP umbrella? And is it considered a, a school within a school or is it, is it more integrated, right? Because I, I think we have to understand that clearly so we can communicate to parents. Yeah, at the, at the middle school, it's more of a program at a school, um, right? So, so I'm taking, just like I would take a, a, you know, a different interest or a different, uh, course of study, it becomes, it becomes a program at our school, just like high school, right? So if, if they're matriculating to high school, uh, students in the dual immersion program should have the option to continue to explore and, and grow in the area of, uh, of biliteracy, bilingualism, biculturalism, and multi, really, we should be talking about multi. Uh, at the high school level, that doesn't necess does that does not necess necessarily make the high school a dual immersion high school. It's a dual immersion program at our high school. So, with that being said, I think I'm I, I'm forming an opinion that um, I, I think I'm in favor of offering one TK eight school, and that not being the dual immersion program, and continuing to offer to to think about the unified middle school as the MYP, knowing that those dual immersion elementary students, when they go to the single middle school, if, if when they go to the single middle school, because they wouldn't be at the, the regular K-8, that they would have the opportunity to continue their language education in the MYP program. So, so you're kind of what I said earlier, now we're talking about making sure that we are moving in the right direction and making sure that we're not, um, what is it at? putting our kids right in, in two TK-8 so that way we have a strong middle school. Um, 
I see another head nodding over here. Um, hello, uh, board member Greer. Can you hear us? Talking to me? Yes, hello. Yes, yes, just making sure, just want to kind of loop you in. Uh, we, we just uh, went over the, the paperwork, um, the models, um, the, the, the map that um, we were given, the 10-year demographic data, and we just started the dialogue basically on, uh, it was the, T, the two TK8s or the one TK8, and then um, board member Bo uh, was was asking about the dual immersion uh, district wide. How many kids we had? We have we have 439 students, TK through fifth grade, and once they get to middle school, it becomes a program at the school. And so one of the things that we are bringing up, and um, there's here, us here um, at uh, in the boardroom, but one of the things I haven't heard from is a board member Kusin Salter yourself. What do you guys think of us just having one TK through eight instead of two? So we can go ahead and have that conversation now so we can start eliminating. So I'll, I'll go ahead and add my thoughts and I have a bit of an unstable connection. I hope you all can hear me. As, as I'm looking at just capacity numbers and, and looking at how capacity is affected by going with one TK8 versus going to uh, two TK8s, uh, I'm, I'm of the mind that it would, that it would make sense of those two options to, to go a TK, uh, to have a one TK8 model. Um, I'll also add, it would be, it would be also important to, to note just from, from our community. Um, I know that we have a TK8 now, but it would be helpful to add, and this is as I've in, interfaced with some, some parents and, and folks within the community, is, is, there a, is there a pool? If we have a TK8 um, that, that was offered, how many, how many within our community would, would, would truly be interested in, in desiring to go to and, and attend a TK-8 versus, um, I know we, we made Ellington uh, uh, was made as a TK-8 as a means of providing a uh, middle school option in closer proximity. And so there may be folks who have stayed there because of that. I just, I just wonder how many, how many folks from our community go to Ellington be, because TK-8 as a model is a draw. Um, are, and so do you mean are, a we, transfer? are we looking to solve it? I'm sorry? They trans like they transferred if they had to go like the center or to Slaw Center Foothill, like they actually transferred to Ellington because it's a TK through eight. Is that? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I wonder how many, I wonder how many people in our community look at the options that are in front of them that live on another part of town and say, I would prefer that my student go to a TK eight. And as a result of that, relocate their students to a TK-8 in order to, to take advantage of that program. Um, that's just, that, that's something that, I, that, I, that I'd be curious of. But of the two options, if we were looking at one or two, I would say one. Um, but, I, but I even, I, I wonder if, look, if, 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 it, if it would be worthwhile to even look at uh, the, the, the draw of the TK-8 at all. I think that's a, that's a great question. Actually, I, have this, I had the same question tonight. I would like to know how many students actually live around Ellington that actually go there and are not in another district. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of people that live around there don't come to our district. Um, you know, th they've chosen to go to Covina. Um, I know a lot of the students that were supposed to go to Center or Slauson or Foothill have transferred to Ellington because of that TK3, but they don't live by Ellington. So um, what, what board member Greer requested and I myself would like to know where um, the demographics of our students at Ellington. Where are they coming from and what part of the area and what is their home school? But I also know that the purpose of us having the TK8 at, at Ellington, because we were losing students to Las Palmas, um, and when we made it a TK8, then the students were not leaving. It seemed like um, they were there, and then when it came to 7th and 8th grade, and of course they had to either go to Slauson or Center, I don't know if it was too far for them, but um, they were sent him to Las Palmas. But then we noticed they came back to Glasson High School. So they would return. So when we made a TK-8, then they didn't leave. Well, maybe a few, but not as many as we had. I don't have the exact figures, but it did make a difference. But I believe those are the kids who are, that live in that area. I'm not sure it's on the outside, but that live there. 
uh, I do recall that story. And that, that, that was several years ago, so we have the new data now. Yes, board member. Um, so, uh, board president, uh, some time ago, Dr. Mitchell, I had um, asked you to run the numbers on inter-district transfers. So students coming, transferring into the district per school, so into each of our sites and where they're coming from. So without, you know, I don't have access to any personally identifiable information, but the last time you shared this with me, um, at Ellington, there were 13 students transferring into Ellington from Baldwin Park, Bovina, Glendora, Hacienda, and a few others. So transfers in. And then what was the, re the reason? Was it the reason because the programs? Was yeah. it the reason because the TK8? I, I would always like to know what is the reason either they're, why they're coming as is unified or why they're leaving as is unified. It'd be good to know that. Sure. And I think, you know, we're, we, we've had the conversations about border schools or we've, we've had at least had indirect conversations about border schools. And so looking at um, an enrollment, current enrollment at, at Ellington of 410 students, let's say it's 13, let's say it's 15, maybe it's 20, you know, currently. That, I think that gives us a sense of the scale of who is transferring into Ellington and from where. Okay, board member Bo, what, your question, you made the statement there was 13 students from out of the district at Ellington, but was there a question with that? I, I was trying to answer your question when you said, where are they, where are they coming from? And so I had asked Dr. Mitchell for this data some months ago. Right. And so, I mean, did they choose Ellington because like no, the programs, fine. was it because of work? Um, yeah. If if it was, let's just, you know, let, let's be real. Say we did not keep Ellington and it would be Valleydale that would be the school. Would the parents still come? Right? Is it because of the TK? I mean, we need to know these reasons why these parents are coming. Right? Another, another. Um, since, since we're in the, the subject of, you know, how many students do we have coming to Azusa High for the IB program out of the district? Can you please get that information? I think that that's that's another question that we, right? I, I think also would be great to know even the medical pathway at Glassman High School. I mean, the programs that we have, the programs, the, the important thing is, you know, we have many wonderful programs. Um, you know, are they being effective? You know, are, you know, how many students do we have enrolled in these programs? You know, how many people are coming from the outside just to come to our programs? I mean, that'd be great to know this information. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we can probably put some of those pieces in the parking lot and focus on the TK-8 concept. Um, I think, um, Gabriela, you asked for you know, for me to weigh in. Um, so I, I think what I heard Adrian saying, and I agree with him, is, is to understand whether internally in our district we have interest that's transferring in there. So I was think, I think I, what, I, what I think would be valuable is to understand, do we have a, what kind of intra, so in, within our district transfers that we have going to that school, right, to, to really think about. And, and really, that would be a proxy for thinking about whether there's interest in our community to attend TK-8 school, or if it really is, we really, I, I know when we, you know, Yolanda, I agree with you, when we put it in, it was really trying to serve the need of that community, right, who really had asked for something yeah. close by and not far away. So I think that's really, I think that's a key piece that we need to think about. For me, the other questions that I have in terms of TK-8, TK and I will just tell you, I'm leaning even maybe against thinking about even having a TK-8, or it may be you know, reevaluating in the future whether it makes sense to bring it into one of our schools and not be part of this this current reorganization. And the reason I say that is for a couple things. Um, so I think when we first, when there was a, when the when it was brought up by the previous superintendent to try to move our whole district to TK eight, some of the issues that arose were around programs, right, and whether these students would have access to daily physical education, what type of um, um, what are those called? Um, the not their core courses, I'm dropping the name. Uh, oh, can you help me? Elective, right, exactly, thank you, yeah. What kind of electives students have access to, right? Whether that's gonna be um, organized and comprehensive, um, you know, really does it just default to um, falling on the shoulders of the teachers there to figure out what that would be at that K-8 school. Um, so those those kind of programmatic concerns, I think, you know, they, 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 were, they, they arose several years ago, and I'm not sure that we've addressed them even for the K that we have in our district right now, right? And I think that, you know, we wanna make sure that we're providing a, 
a full education to our middle school students at the TK-8 school. So I think those, I have questions about that. I have so questions about whether or not there's a desire in our district or whether it'll just by default, the students, because we make it the students in that community are gonna go there to what kind of programs would be at this TK-8 school? Would we be able to give full access to similar experiences, especially around physical education and, and the electives? And then number three, I'm just expressing concern about what happens if there, maybe if there's not, desire or if the enrollment in that area drops such, to such a level that we then start having combination classes, which I understand we now do have some, we don't have full enough enough students to, to have two full sections like we used to at Ellington. So what happens at that point with that program if you start having combination classes because I, or having to mix grades? Because I feel like that's one thing that as we move to reorganization, we need to focus on trying to prevent. So I think those are the three three areas that, that I would express concern around and make me feel like the TKA piece maybe is something that we can think about after we have really solid programs in the, all of our current schools. So that's where I am right now. Thank you, board member Greer. Yeah, uh, board member Cruz Gonzalez, I think more accurately summed up what, what my thoughts were, thank you, um, and, and around what are our internal transfers and what, what do those look like? So 100% so what, what she shared, that, that's what I would uh, like to see because again, yes, that will communicate what type of interests we have. So every chilling everything you just said is are, are, are I, I echo those 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 same thoughts so i guess we're asking for two different things we're asking for internal transfers and we're also asking for intradist is it a outside district transfers I'll because one of the you. things that I remembered, um, uh, for example, the IB program was to attract other people from other districts. Um, and so one of the things that I also have noticed um, that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, we don't assess, our, um, we, we don't go back and see how our programs do, you know, how, how they're doing for the year, how successful they are, how many students are we keeping in the program, how many have graduated, you know, how many are continuing. I, 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 I haven't seen that. Um, and that's something that I would like to go ahead and start with this transition is to assess our programs each year and how they're doing. But, but I also, I do agree with Shiloh also regarding the, you know, the K-8, you know, uh, I, I, I do recall that when it first opened, people were not, our parents, they were not aware of the curriculum because they didn't realize there it was going to be elementary curriculum where the electives in the band and the PE, like you mentioned, were, you know, the, the minutes were a lot less than they would if they were in a middle school. Are you guys suggesting so to ask that, the parents? Is, is that no, what I'm hearing? No, my, 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 I'm just saying that. Um, so we need to look deeply do, I mean, really, do we really need a K-8? Just like I mentioned that the, that the students from Ellington would leave because they had to go to maybe uh, Center and Slauson. Maybe it was too far for them, but they came back in high school. So just saying, if it's Glasson High School was was the mega uh, seventh and eighth, maybe they wouldn't go to Las Palmas because it, it it's still close to them. So I mean, do we really want to have a K to eight? If it that, yeah, I agree with Shiloh on that one. Can I just Board uh, Gonzalez? Yeah, thank you. Um, so so Gabby, I'm not. I don't want. I'm not trying. Gabriela, so excuse me. Um, I'm not. I, I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to contradict you. But I just want to be just really clear, at least from my perspective, right? When we put in programs like International Baccalaureate, when we put in the TKA programs, we're putting them in my mind to give the students in our district a high quality education and opportunity. I'm a big fan of IB. And the reason I am is because when I went off to MIT and I was in a dorm room with a lot a dorm area with a lot of international students, they had all taken IB and they had all had pretty much their first year of, of credits already going walking into MIT as freshmen, they came in almost as sophomores because of the International Baccalaureate program. So that is why I'm a believer in, and And I would like to see our students have those opportunities. So I just wanna make that clear because I think Having attracting people from outside of our district is a bonus, always a bonus. But to me, we our first mission is to serve the community that we live in. I'm sorry, board member Kristen Sellis. I I'm not understanding what you're saying. You're contradicting me. What I was trying to say is that we should assess every program, not just the IB program. But and I, and I think that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's it. 
So getting back to the TK issue, I just wanted to be very clear. I, I, I think what I'm saying is I feel like it's for, I am comfortable having a conversation about school consolidations and closing schools and saying at this point right now, we're not gonna look to do a TK-8 um, unless, unless it makes sense after we see which schools close in terms of you know, the need in that community. And then I think that's something that we could build out in that school as it feel, as it, if it seems like that is something that is needed in one of our community, one of our areas. That would be my, that's where I am leaning toward. Board Member Greer? I would agree with that with one caveat. Uh, I would like to see that information that we, uh, from Ellington. So if we were to, you know, I'm making these numbers up, right? If, if we saw that 50% of, of the students at Ellington were from outside of the district uh, and other, other parts of town that were transferring in specifically because they were looking for a TK-8 experience, then that would communicate to me that there is interest within our community for, for a TK-8. So, so I, I, I would, I would uh, agree with Shilini with the one caveat of, uh, and maybe you're saying the same thing, but but uh, of seeing what the data suggests on uh, the internal transfers to Ellington from outside of their, the, the Ellington area. So just to be clear, you would like to see this, this data before we continue the conversation about eliminate, you know, not having a TK through eight, is it, is that correct? I, yeah. So. I think that we, we could, I think we can continue forward with this com with the conversation. I think the data will speak for itself um, as, as we get that, in that information. I'd be comfortable moving forward, uh, um, piggybacking Sheila's suggestion of moving forward under the, the you, know, a, you know, potential assumption that we would uh, look at TK through five uh, only and not have a TK unless the data suggests otherwise, at which point then uh, we should look at at uh, ensuring that that's part of the, the model to begin with. Okay, to, just to be clear, we went from two TK through eight, now to talking to one, and now moving forward, we want to have a conversation of having no TK through eight, TK through five, so that way we can have the six through eight mega middle school. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, who would like to go ahead and continue the conversation? or have any questions. So I'd like to then now shift to, I think the conversation that Sabrina brought, started initiating and talking about programs and I think referencing maybe certain um, programs at different school sites. Um, so I, I just wanna say that I, um, I think we all got an email from a teacher that I have a lot of respect for from and she really articulated some of the, some of the things that I was thinking about in terms of asking students to specialize at a very young age and really about whose choice is being made when, when we have um, these sort of magnet school approach at the elementary level. Um, and instead thinking about how do, we, how do we put in a really strong base program that every student gets? I think we've already made a commitment to bring in steel. And I think if we as a, as a community and a board and just an organization, a, a district as a whole, understood sort of the, the, the depth and richness of that approach, right? And the ability to pull in some of these areas like art or music um, that are really embedded in that, that program. I'm thinking about, is it, in my mind, I'll just say, instead of asking question, I think in my mind, it's more valuable to say, we, we have decided this is our approach. Let us make sure that we do a really amazing implementation of it um, and try to pull in these other pieces. And along those lines, I think we could think about how do we how do we strengthen these pieces? Like we talk about art, right? How do we find a way to bring in live art instructors, right? Instead of using package curriculum that we use that which has been great, right? But it's not the same thing of a replacement of having like a true art, having a, an arts instructor, right? That, that So kids are able to have somebody whose background is art in their classroom. So, so thinking about at the elementary level, how do we build in those pieces? to give all the children across our district or example, the, or the STEM program, or for example, how do we build in those pieces so that students are getting, getting experiences in all these really critical areas so that as they move on to middle school or high school, they already have sort of that base knowledge of all these different really places where you could specialize. And, and, then, and then as they get older, you know, they are drawn to the interest that they're, in, they're, that they're interested in, as opposed to arbitrarily saying, okay, now you're at the art school. So this is what you're going to focus on. Now you're at the STEM school. Um, so I think that's, that's where I am leaning in terms of specialization. I think that we have key programs that it's good to strengthen. I mean, 
and I'll just say in terms of my mind, when I hear us talking about dual immersion and try to equate that to like a STEM program, our program, in my mind, dual immersion is the language kids are learning in. I've seen plenty of examples where you have a dual immersion school that has STEM with it, right? So to me, dual immersion is the language of instruction, not necessarily it's a program that's on the level of, of a STEM or a arts or that kind of mega program. I mean, obviously you have to opt in, right? But in my mind, we should be thinking about how do they also get those same opportunities in terms of enrichment. So that's what I'm just to start this conversation. One of the things that um, you said that, that kind of resonated with me as um, my son graduated from Gladstone High School, he only had four years of uh, computer science, right? And it was very limited. When he got to Loyola Marymount, one of the things he said is, um, I wish I would have started, started coding at a, in kindergarten, first grade, right? And so me being true, wanting to stay here in Azusa Unified, not having my kids in another district, kept him here. And so he missed out. So he's a little behind in college now compared to his, you know, his, his colleagues who've had coding since they were in kindergarten, first grade. So I, I hear you, um, board member Cruz Gonzalez, that it's one of these things and uh, that it's one of the things that we need to start here. If we are going to make this transition, right? Our kids need to start from a very young age and be able to follow that path because it's it, when it's sustainable and it's a strong program, it does prepare them for their future. It prepares them for greater things where, I mean, we have next door, we, we, we have these programs that are taking our kids, right? We have uh, Covina, we have Doherty, Glendora right next to us. And I think the vision that I'm that I'm seeing from each, you know, as you guys are speaking, and what I'm what I'm what I'm seeing is that is that we want to make um, our programs. Um, one of the things that board member Bo said is a pathway, like a pipeline, like right, something that can be sustainable can start from a very young age. And so I think that. The majority of us here, yeah, all of us feel feel very strongly about that. And um, one of the things, uh, like coding, would you know, coding would be great to have here for our students to start. I know, you know, five families who've left our district in the last four years because of coding, they would come back in a heartbeat. I remember uh, Cruz Gonzalez just to add some uh, context, and please, if this is incorrect. Um, I'm going to project. So this is uh, uh, an option uh, that we presented uh, to the school reorganization team, um, and then we presented to the board of education. So this is this is the option that we would go to a a base program, right? So that every school would have preschools, SEAL, mild mod uh, special education, STEM, uh, visual and performing arts. Right, parks and rec, and so every school would have this this program as a strong as a strong uh, base. Um, so th this was one option, and then of course we went to option two, which was create these magnets or these academies. But this this is just to give us context and bring us back. Right, this was one of the options that that we presented as a, as a possibility for uh, for our um, for our schools. And then there's nothing to prevent us also from saying, yes, all of these schools will have this. And then one school will be the school of the art, uh, school of the arts. Right. I don't think it has to be either or. We don't have to make all of them magnets or academies. Uh, but again, just throwing that out there just as a to bring context into it, uh, that this was definitely an option that we saw as as viable and strong as well. Right, and just to clarify, so yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is I prefer option one, and I'm also saying that we should not, I'm not talking about taking away what we've already built out, right? So if we already have capacity where there's built out around arts at a school site or STEM at another school site, right? I'm not suggesting we all would say, okay, no, that's going to go away now. I'm saying, let's not, let's let's work on for everybody. I, I guess I'm saying option one with just strengthening, continuing to strengthen existing programs is what I would be saying. And, and I agree. I mean, Arch Mr. Faye, if you could put, could you put that slide back up? A hundred percent, yes. So, 
here, I mean, nothing on these bullet points is controversial, right? These are all really good programs. And why wouldn't we have them for every one of our PK38 students, right? I mean, I think we're all nodding. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back to a couple of meetings ago, board member Rogers Panion, when we talked about middle school and middle school being a very pivotal time in students' development. Unique students, mm -hmm. I call them. <laughs> it, it's, it's, um, and so, I mean, I'm more and more drawn to this idea of the mega middle school, right? So that we can have, you have to have enough students to offer program, right? And middle schoolers need their own programming. It's they ha that they're building their identity. Um, it's really, it, it's, it's a time to really catch students and inspire them for, for the years ahead. Um, so that we're operating off a little bit of numbers. Dr. Mitchell, can you tell us how many seventh and eighth graders we have at Ellington? Because I think we've alluded to maybe we have some combination classes or we don't have two full sections. So how many students are in seventh and eighth grade there? Yep. I and perhaps for the next meeting or at a be before the next meeting, can you tell us or uh, provide a report about the um the retention rate, meaning the student who is in, how many of our eighth graders were there from kindergarten, right? Or were there from first grade? Or did they come in at sixth grade? So for the first question, how many, was it sixth, seventh, and eighth grade or just seventh? Seventh and eighth. Uh, seventh and eighth, it is uh, 66. Is that three sections? That is two seventh eight. and one eighth, or that's one seventh grade class and one seven eight class. Yes. Sorry, say that again. Wait, can you just repeat the numbers? Oh yeah, sure. So there's one grade seven class, one seven eight combo class. And the total number of students is? And the total number of students is, is 66. Sorry, that's wrong. Oh, when, there's one more eighth grade class. I didn't scroll up. There's another eighth grade class that is 33 students. That's on top of the 66? Yes. Oh, yes, sorry. sorry about that. Okay. Yep. Well, I think getting getting back to program, I mean, I, I keep looking at my notes and the 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 themes that leap out to me are art, STEM, dual immersion, and IB. And going back to that slide with the, you know, those very solid base programs that all of our school, all of our students should be experiencing, I 100% support that. When we get to talking about preschool, I think we need to do a little more work about how we roll out preschool at every site, if that makes sense, you know, what, what's the pace of that so that we're implementing programs that have enough students, again, to have the appropriate staffing, that have the quality of instruction. Um, but the idea of having a preschool at every elementary site, the idea is appealing, but I don't want to do it just to say we have it. I want it, I would like to make sure it makes sense to expand our preschool sites as our um, demand grows for preschool. And um, Dr. Mitchell, if I'm not mistaken, I think we are only two schools out 
that do not have a preschool. Correct. Every other elementary site already has a program. Um, one of our one of our programs on site, and I believe the two schools. Yes, ma'am. No, I was gonna. You're gonna answer my question right now. The two sites, I believe, and again, uh, Dana, if I'm incorrect, I think the two sites that currently do not have. Uh, one of our preschools are Hodge and Ellington. Uh, but every other elementary school has at least one section, some schools, more sections of our preschools on campus already. So kind of going back uh, to a conversation um, a couple meetings ago, and I'll stand along uh, talking about preschool. Um, one of the things that we had um, spoken about was making sure that, and I remember it was board member Bo, having a sustainable right preschool to go ahead and feed into into the schools. And so, let, I, I would like to have the conversation about about that um, at this moment. And what does that look like for us to have the preschools at each of the schools? not have long felt. So I heard you say that we do have preschools at all but two site plus Longfellow as its own standalone preschool site. Correct. Can I, can I, um, can I jump in on this? Yeah, thank you. And, and this is actually for parking lot um, because I appreciate Sabrina bringing this up. Um, um, I do I do think that it would be good to have a conversation about preschools and thinking about how expanding and I know I mean I know that there is desire for full day preschool and we you know we used to offer only half day and we don't have other options around early childhood preschool so thinking about that and I just for me personally um, you know I, I think Arturo you know I've always thought that to really build it out we'd also I, it would be great if we actually were offering Head Start as well and be able to mix all of these approaches so I, I just want to put that on parking lot. Um, but I think I agree with what I heard Sabrina, what I, I think I heard the same thing Sabrina heard, right? That is that we, we really have enough need for preschool that we are, that we're out building it out at all the school sites plus Longfellow and we're still filling all these programs. Is that, is that what I heard at all? Uh, that is correct. And again, at some schools, uh, based on uh, demand and, and need, uh, we have multiple uh, sections open at particular uh, sites. So then my question would be, if we wanted to go ahead and strengthen our right, our 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 preschool community, could we open up more more preschool classrooms at our school? And I'm gonna I'm gonna let uh, Dana weigh in on this, but my understanding is yes. My understanding is as the demand is there. Uh, we continue to build out and open more sections uh, at those sites uh, as we see the demand continue to grow. So let's pretend we have we have one AM session and now there's a waiting list of five, six, seven, eight. Oh, we have enough students. Let's go ahead and figure out how we open up another section. And so that has we have been building as that interest continues to grow. Uh, we have been building out uh, sections at our at our school sites. And what does it look like to have a full day preschool for our, our community, for our school district? Yeah, that's something that uh, we keep uh, a close tab on. Uh, we are looking at that uh, all the time. Uh, we have a strong desire to open up a full year, full, full day uh, preschool uh, for our community. Board member Cruz and Salas? Yes, no, I, 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 yes, I appreciate that. And like I said, I, I, I'm not looking to have a conversation about that tonight, but I do think it's something that at some point we should talk about in terms of what, you know, our focus in the early childhood, especially as the state is looking to expand that, you know, expanding TK and changing the staffing requirements ratios for TK, right? So I think there's a lot to talk about that, but not, not in this meeting. But do, should we talk about this as we, we are, we're reconfigurating and we're making all these decisions? Arturo, I mean, my question would be then, do we feel like we have the capacity, even with the, as you reorganize, that we're going to be able to continue to offer preschool at this, at, as needed at the, at the sites as well as at Longfellow? I mean, that, that's the question, right? But I think you've already answered. So right now, 
right, with having Longfellow as an option, then that's where uh, parents uh, decide to go in, in that particular uh, campus. Uh, what we have seen is uh, as we have been building them, uh, people have been coming and showing up. Uh, and again, at some sites, um, more than than we anticipate. And so we have been uh, responding to that. Um, I guess we could foresee a, a, a future or a scenario where uh, we outgrow the physical space. Uh, then at that point in time, it's just, again, readjusting to ensure that, uh, that we're securing, um, you know, that additional uh, space and making sure that it's that we get it uh, licensed and and ready to uh, ready to go. And do you know if those students in Longfellow, um, do they live in our district or are they coming from the outside or do do we know that? Oh. Not off the top of my head. I can look at that the. That would be good to know. I can look at the at the um, at the report uh, that Dr. Bo was referencing. I think there might be something there. I'll look that up real quick. Yeah, because I was just wondering if if um if they're from our district, why aren't they going to their their school site? You know, why are they going to Longfellow? Not that this is the the reason, uh, but in the north side, uh, those are so we have Hodge, which currently doesn't have a preschool. Oh. Um. We have Dalton, which is a new, a one of the newer uh, preschools, um, and we have Lee, which is also one of the newer preschools. So if you just look at the map, there was there were very little options until recently for families to take their schools. I'm sorry, to take their students uh, to preschool, so they had to they, they would have to travel to another. So again, Lee and Dalton, uh, newer, and then there was nothing at Hodge, and so that made it that made it. That made Longfellow attractive for those that lived yeah. in, in that area. So at this point, I'm I'm comfortable. Um, I, I'm I don't see the need to debate additional preschool. I think as we as as we continue to build the the K eight or the K the elementary program at the sites, I think preschools will come. But I do want to make this comment, and I hope it doesn't land the wrong way. Um, up until this moment, I thought we only offered preschool at Longfellow. And when I go to the district website and I go to our about us, our programs, and I go to district highlights and I click on early childhood education, I get the, the school profile PDF. It doesn't tell me that preschools are at other sites. And so I'm, I'm, I hope that we can fold this into the conversation next week in our communication study session. But how do we tell families, how do we tell community members who are coming into the district, who are looking at, you know, moving here, that we do offer preschool and, and where we and where it is? I, I mean, I say this because I'm, I'm one person, but I, I'm not, I can't be the only person that didn't know we had preschool at other sites besides Longfellow. And also, what is the enrollment at Longfellow? It's not written on So moving forward, so we're we're going to go ahead and start the conversation without the TK-8 and yeah, start the conversation with TK-5, right? Okay, and the board, yes. So let, let, let's, one of the things that um, I noticed here at um, these models, right, as we are not looking at the two K-8, let, let, let's have a conversation about 
Gladstone High School um, being the middle school and Azusa being the high school and then flipping it and Azusa High School being the middle school and Gladstone High School being the mega high school. I would like to hear from my colleagues on what, any questions that they have or opinions. Do we know though on budget wise, um, whichever high school it will be, what would the cost be? Would it be more on one school or one in the other? You know, what has more capacity? You know, what ones are going to need more um, modules or um, base wise also? I like to know that on each of the high schools, I think that's how we would determine what, what high school would be. Uh, feasible for for these students to put them together to merge them so if we're looking at budget um very purposes only azusa high school would be the one school where based on the current projected enrollment all students could fit without adding any additional modulars um glassstone high school based on its current capacity we would need at least a couple of more classrooms because they would already be at 105 percent capacity okay thank you welcome just to put it out there, just to put it out there as a as a bigger context. Um, again, we have just preliminarily preliminarily looked at the at the schools. Um, if we were thinking of just the campus again, as a high school, class one high school, uh, both schools have a section of their schools um, that are uh, portables. Um, it's not the whole entire campus; it's just a section. And so, if if that was something that we would look at then um, the cost could be similar. I think I agree with Latasha. Glassstone High School would be a little bit more expensive because it, it's not just replacing, it's adding a couple more modulars as well. Can, can we also talk about one of the things that, um, I know you guys are talking about the modules, but looking at how dilapidated Azusa High School is and how much work it needs, because as we're going through this reconfiguration, what I would like to see is for us to be able to, if we're going to make a mega high school, we, we have to make it big. We have to make it great. We have to, right? There's asbestos. Um, that we're going to be uh, taking care of some walls and, you know, renovating. How, because we want it to happen, right? What does that look like? What does that projection look like? So we provided the figures um, to update or to modernize Azusa High School as far as rebranding and repainting. But we have not assessed every building based on upgrades. So I would need to know what we're envisioning as far as um, if we're looking at Azusa High School, and then I can give you figures on that. Because also, you know, the the asphalt was in um, their quad, I guess you want to call it, that needs a lot of uplifting and straightening it out. Yes. It's all bumpy and everything. And those are the things that we need to know budget wise, you know, uh, and what, uh, like I brought before regarding the, the adult school, we didn't know we needed a parking lot there. We ended, you know, all of a sudden we needed a parking lot and then we needed um, a fence because the fire department has to have the gate bigger come in. We didn't know these things prior when we made this, made the, the last decision uh, on the, um, the removal of, of last uh, street school. And so uh, those are the things we, we need to know also. What, what, what would that kind of cost us? The asphalt, I mean, even the parking lot. I mean, it, it's... Yes. It doesn't mean they're just going to go and fit there. I'm sure there's other things that are going to have to be done. And what year was um, Azusa High built? What year was Glaston High School built? I can look into that. Call. Um, but as it relates to asphalt, um, that is a district-wide need. Um, so no matter what school we select, that is one of the projects that we're actually getting a district-wide RFP because there's a need district-wide for us to update our asphalt for all on campus. I think the first graduating class from Azusa High School is 1958. So at least 
1854-53 was when it was built. It was uh, the first class of Gladstone was 1969. My mother-in-law was the first graduating class. I have a question on um, facilities. So how much, how much um, money do we have left in Measure K? And how do our Measure K funds, how are we planning to use them for facilities upgrade? So right now we have approximately 40 million remaining in our um, bond fund. And we've paused all of our construction projects um, with the hopes of understanding the need of the school reorganization. And then we will reallocate those dollars to those sites. One of the things um, that as we're, as we're speaking about the middle school and the high school, regardless of where we end up, because we, we still haven't really talked about it, um, what, what I would like to see is, is the pools, it, it, you know, they need to get renovated. They need to be working for our students. We have swimmers. We have a coach at Gladstone High School who is fully committed during COVID, you know, when it was, when they were able to practice, even throughout the years when Gladstone has not had a swimming pool, they have a tree growing out of it right now. She would go, you know, and try to find these students a place for them to, I would like to see for us to have these pools renovated and working. So one of the things that I suggested last week to, um, to, to look for county money that is out there. I um, I don't know if you got a chance to, to do that. So um, that, that's one of the things that I would like to see included um, as we're talking about, um, you know, these this big mega middle school and big mega high school. It's great that we're going to, you know, we have the fields that the, you know, middle school and high school can continue to use. But let's also talk about the polls. And that's something that, um, right, get an estimate of how much it would be for, for us to, to be able to, to renovate and to get these polls working. Um, and necessarily, this money wouldn't have to come from Measure K, um, basically come from LA County. They just need to know a number. Yes, so I will get, I'm, I'm pulling that up now. We did receive a quote on the renovation. So give me one second. It was as low as 5.4, as high as 7. Board member Bo. Um, Ms. Jamal, I have a question around our, um, I know we've, we're continuing to look at the capacity by site, so seat capacity. Um, do you already have a report or can we quickly get together a report of each of the campuses kind of from a, a master planning perspective, how many classrooms, how many meeting spaces, if there's an auditorium, the acreage of each site. So as we, we look at number of students and we look at our, our goal of having these strong base programs so that, for example, every elementary school would have um, a parent room, it would have a special ed room, it would have each of these kind of specialized rooms. Um, do you have that um, handy or is that something we can get um, before Thanksgiving? Um, yes, I could work towards that. So the capacity that we have in front of us identified as walking each classroom to identify how many classrooms could be utilized for space. And then we subtracted four classrooms, um, one for a parent resource room, one for a preschool. What was it, three classrooms? I'm sorry. It was more at the high school. I think we did six. Okay, I thought uh, Dr. Rose just in general. I'm sorry. I believe she's referring to the high school, correct? I'm, I'm referring to all schools, all sites. So here, this is just number of seats, right? Um, to make it more tangible, okay. right? So school campus A has 20 classrooms, uh, a space, you know, or it has 25 classrooms. And in our reorganization, 20 of those would be general classroom spaces, 
the 21st would be the parent room, the 22nd would be the special education room, the 23rd would be the library, something like that. The 24th would be the VAPA room or it's the science lab. Just so it may, becomes more real. So when we say we're talking about every um, elementary school having these rich programs, where are we going to house these programs? So yes, then, then to, to Latasha's point, uh, right now, the, the way the capacity was, was built was uh, counting every room that can house students and then subtracting four rooms to be used for other, other things. So we have, for instance, uh, the innovation lab. We have uh, a parent center. We have a library. Um, we didn't quite specifically you know, pinpoint, but we said, okay, we, let's do additional four. And I believe at the high schools, I could be wrong, Natasha, I think we said six. Yes, at a minimum, yes. But I mean, we can put that on paper. And I, I'm pushing a little bit because yep. I think we, we've talked about it generally and we agree that we need these auxiliary spaces. And when we write it down, it's a, it's a commitment to say, yes, we have, these are for regular classroom use and these are our auxiliary uses. And we're, built, and we're going to then ensure that each campus has the same type of auxiliary spaces because we think that's important. Yes, 100%. So, yeah, every, every capacity that we have put so far subtracts four rooms at the elementary level and six at the high school level. So when we look at, at uh, adults in 489 capacity, that means 489 can fit into classrooms, but we still have four empty classrooms that we can use and repurpose for something else. Will you also include the multi-purpose space? So if there are indoor cafeteria spaces, library spaces, I mean, I'm thinking of rainy day spaces that are not in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if all of our campuses have that type of large multi-purpose space. Do they? Every single campus has a multi-purpose um, cafetorium. Um, so every, every campus does have, have one of those. Um, in terms of the other specs, I'm not hundred percent sure. Again, we can, we can, we can put that on paper for you. And I'm also interested in the acreage of the site. And just to confirm, is this for every school site that we currently have open? Or are we looking for those that we are planning to remain open? Just so I can understand. I'd like to look tag. at every site. Yes, and I think it's whether or not we're going to use it. I think we need to have, we need to know the capacity, the, the size and the types of buildings on that site. Okay. Board Member Greer. Uh, just to go back real quick to a question that was asked in regards to our Measure K fund dollars. Um, uh, Mr. Ma, I'm gonna ask a, a question that kind of goes back to your, to what was on your predecessor's desk. Um, but, but maybe we can, we can try to understand what what the, what might have been discussed back then. So, in addition to the Measure K dollars, there was also I want to say 19 million in state refunded dollars or, or reimbursement dollars. When you say that there's 40 million left in Measure K, well, one, do you know what I'm referring to? And and two, when we you say there's 40 million, does that include that number, or or does that exclude that number? That includes that number. And yes, so what we have done is we use bond projects to submit for other state funding. And as those funds come in, they are at, allocated to what is available for uh, bond projects going forward. So we have a total remaining of all funding sources that could be utilized for bond projects of approximately $40 million. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So I would like to, at this time, ask my colleagues, um, what do you guys think about Gladstone High School being the middle school or Gladstone High School being the high school or vice versa, Azusa High being the middle school or Azusa High being the high school? Board well, member Boke? Board member Boke, go ahead. <laughs> I saw your shake. <laughs> All right, I get to go first. Um, 
from a numbers perspective, um, it seems to make it makes sense to me to have Azusa High School site remain the high school site and transition the Gladstone High School site to be the the middle the unified middle school site. Because I heard we uh, say that if we combined all of our nine twelve students to Gladstone, we would necessarily have to add a couple of portable. You know, that's exactly what I was going to say. Thank you. And and yeah. And we have a lot of work to do at Azusa High School anyway. I'd rather have that be for actual upgrades rather than classroom, but additional classrooms. Or member Greer? Yeah, I would, I would agree with the fact that the, the numbers that we've been presented with seem to suggest that Azusa High School makes sense to be the centralized high school, Madison High School as a centralized middle school. Um, but I, I, similar to board member Rodriguez Pena's question, I, I, I do wonder what are some of those other additional costs um, that that go into ensuring that, that the site is is set up um, to, to best house students. Um, so it would make sense to move forward under the under that assumption in, in, in my book, but but I, I would love to collect some of that information prior to you know fully solidifying. Board Member Cruz and Salas. So I, I would agree. Um, and additionally, I would just add, I think um, it would make sense to think about if we are, since we are closing Foothill Middle School, how do we utilize that potentially as an annex for Azusa High? I mean, I so when I go to work in Long Beach every day, there's a school, an elementary school where the city actually blocks off the street so that kids from an elementary school can go can walk across that street. So it's actually closed during the day. So it's, so kids can walk across the street to go to their to go to their field. So um, as an example, so thinking about since we would have a full empty site now right next to the high school, how do we then utilize that to think about how do we um, make sure there's additional space for Azusa High, as, as opposed to thinking about now we have to put in additional portables. So and 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 I'm just putting that as a as a suggestion, not saying we, like, that needs to happen. But short answer is I agree. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of, of Azusa High and Foothill being so close to each other, because I do know also Lincoln High School, I think in LA, they do have a school attached, not attached, but like across the street where we can utilize um, uh, Foothill as part of Azusa High. I know we talked about also the overcrowding you, you spoke about last time, um, you know, maybe have some classes there. And um, yeah, and, and, and I, number wise, I think that uh, one of the best choices. And would Foothill Middle School provide overflow space if we're doing construction? Right, we're talking about major upgrades that we, we can't limit those only to summer and winter break. And, and I mean, they even have, Foothill even has two parking lots that I didn't even know, but they do. And yeah. And all the teachers can park mm -hmm. on the parking the lot. Hell? Yes. Fun and spite, so. I, I think that, um, you know, lo looking at, um, but the majority has spoken and um, and we are looking forward to having Gladstone be the middle school, six through eight is what I'm hearing. And Azusa High becoming the nine through 12 high school. And one of the things that um, I, I would agree if we're gonna, you know, Azusa High has, has not been renovated for a very, very, those classrooms, Right. I mean, you, you walk into, I mean, we can, we can talk about elementaries as well, like Paramount. Beautiful on the outside. Ah, inside. It's just not okay. Not okay. And these are things that we're, we're going to have to take into account as, as we're, you know, moving forward with this. And I would agree, but Hill would have the, you know, carry the overflow as we're renovating and, upgrading Azusa High now that we are going to, we are going to make this that one high school. Um, so comments or thoughts? Uh, board member Greer? I, I would like to ask as a, as a request to staff, if we were to move forward with that, with Azusa High School as a centralized high school, Gladstone High School as a centralized middle school, what then is needed at each campus? And, and based, on, based on what has already been assessed as, as those campuses have, have been walked, now knowing 
if, if we were to, to, to assume that that were to be the case, what are those additional changes and what are the costs associated with those, those facilities upgrades on each of those campuses? Um, that, that would be, is, is, what, is, what is the best way to get that from staff? We can, we can work on, on, on something uh, to assess what facilities wise, what might be needed based on this current recommendation. So we'll run with the idea, Azusa High School will be the one high school, Glassstone High School would be the one middle school. And then based on that, uh, we can do some preliminary audits uh, to say, okay, based on this, here's some things we might wanna consider in terms of facilities. And maybe there's a considered list and then there's like have to list. And what's a, what would you say is an appropriate timeline for that turnaround time? I'm gonna let Latasha weigh in on that one. Um, depending on how um, detailed we want to be, um, if we're just saying high level um, painting, asphalt, um, upgrading restrooms, vice versa, I can get that quickly. But if we're literally saying walk the campus and assessing it from top to bottom, I would need to um, work with our architects to do a full evaluation. And, and do you have a sense I, of, I would like to see that. Yeah, do you, if we went that route of the more, the more robust kind of assessment, do you have a sense of a general timeline of what that would take? I would need to reach out to them first and then I can put that in my board update if I can get a response before some Thursday. But I can start with Brian and we could walk the campus and just assess what we see. I um, mean, we could provide that update, and I think we could do that within a couple of weeks. So maybe before Thanksgiving seems feasible? That would be our goal, based on okay. our, our, our assessment. Yes, sir. Okay. Can I just have a clarification? A question, sure. is this also including rebranding, or are we keeping Azusa High School the same, and I'm just looking for the aesthetic of our campus? That's a, that's a conversation we need to have right now. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Board Member Greer, your hand still up. Well, just... Just to share my, my two cents on that. Yeah, I think. We, yeah, since you're we're, already. We're, yeah, brand, branding and whatnot. Yeah, I think that's a conversation that we need to have. Um, I'm, I'm really interested, again, to board member Rodriguez Payne's point. What are those things like the parking lot at, at Gladstone Street that we that we were not aware of? What are those things that would be helpful for us to know that by moving forward in, in, in this direction, the, the additionally associated costs uh, that we, we maybe don't know now? So that that's why it would be worthwhile to wait a couple of weeks, if that was the case, to get to get a more, more robust uh, assessment to, to have a better sense of, of those additional costs. But can we have the conversation about rebranding? Because that, that's something we, we don't need to wait for a facility. Yes, I, I'd like to have the conversation about branding of the high school. We did have figures on that at one time, correct? We, we, yes, ma'am. Right? Uh -huh. Or President, are you talking about the costs involved or are you talking about whether we would or would not? No, 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 not the cost, just the conversation on, on rebranding. Um, since since we now have decided that, right, we're, we're keeping Azusa High, what will the campus at Azusa High, a nine through 12, and the Gladstone High campus, a eight, sorry, six through eight, um, I think it would be in a, you know, a really good, uh, time right now for us to talk about, right? Are we going to keep the name Azusa High at the high school? Are we going to keep Gladstone at the middle school? Or should we rebrand and make it a whole new name, whole new mascot for the middle school and the high school? I think I would like to add the, um, have the community and even the students, you know, um, be able to select or pick names and include them. And also if there is going to be a name change that we should include the community and include students, uh, you know, their input. Board Member Bo. I'm fairly agnostic of whether or not to keep the names or go to a new name. Um, I'm more interested in what's going to happen on the campuses rather than what we call it. And I don't, I'm not meaning to sound crass, but I'm, I'd like to focus our, our money and our energy on the program. Um, my own personal experience, I went to one high school for two years and then they built a new high school 
and they said, okay, you live in this side of town, you stay with your old high school, you live on this side of town, you go to the new high school. So as a junior, I went to our new high school and I didn't, it, it didn't have a big impact on me. Now, yes, I got to go to a new campus, but my old campus wasn't old. It was, you know, we went from a 2000 um, high school, 2000 uh, student high school to each high school was then roughly a thousand students. And as a part of the junior class, we were seniors for two years. But was the new school a new name? Yes, it, because it was a second high school built in my city. Okay. Yeah. That's yes, uh -huh. that was okay. a second high school. So name, that's that's all the only you. context I have yeah. for changing mascots and changing my affiliation during my high school experience. It it wasn't a major impact for me, really. Um, I lost the program, but I gained a program. Right. So the sport I played was no longer offered at my no high school, but we had a, an, another academic program that I participated in at my new high school. So um, just, you know, experience of one, it, it didn't have a large impact on me as an individual. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. So I just, I'll just put on the table, I'm not in favor of changing names of either school. I think it just makes sense to keep it. I think um, aside from just the fiscal responsibility of, you know, the, the cost it would, it would cost to change the names. One of the things to consider is the impact of changing a name on 50, 50 plus years of alumni at the schools and the connection that they have to the school. If we do create, change the name and now suddenly they may not may or may not feel connected to that school. So I, I'll just put on the table that I, 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 would, I would prefer to just keep the names as is. And I'll, I'll just I'll just put on the table for just just to kind of for people to stew on um, Yolanda Rodriguez Pena Middle School. Um, but we'll, I'll, I'll just put it on the table. Right on. We can come back. To that. <laughs> I love those kids. <laughs> All right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. You, you know, um, one of the things that I hear what the two board members are, are saying, but. One of the things that I want to share with the public right now is that my whole childhood during this whole reconfiguration, this is emotional for me. I do have some emotional attachment, but I'm trying to be logical. I'm trying to do what is right for this district. This is not an easy task. And, I, you know, people that, you know, what, what you guys you do one high school, two high schools, you know, please watch the videos. I cannot share what, what I'm thinking right now, right? Because I wanted to hear from my colleagues. I wanted to see the data, right? I think, I think that this question, right, because we, and, and, I'm, and I'm sharing this, right? Um, I've been here for a long time. I went to the Gladstone. My, my brothers and sisters went to Azusa High. And I, and I, and I hear you, you know, um, for Mayor Cruz and Salas, there's a lot of history, right? But, but I think I, I would like to also ask the community, what do they think? I would like to ask the students, not just eight students that have come to a superintendent roundtable or just the parent, I would like to ask the community. This is a big transition, right? So we have the rivals, Gladstone, we have Azusa, right? There's some people that would say, I would never bring my kids to Azusa High School. Or we have the other ones that I would never, right? But at the same time, what it comes down to is we're going into one middle school. We're going into one high school. This is the reality of this. And as we're moving forward, yes, cost-wise, right, it, it would be in, it would be great to keep Azusa High and Gladstone names, but I would like to know what our community thinks. And I also feel, though, in, um, in fairness to the two high schools, you know, I mean, reorganization this is big, yes, but in fairness, I feel that um, 
we can also start fresh. You know, I mean, I make that backlash by that too, but you know, we need to start fresh. We want to start new schools, new names, new locations. It, it's going to be, it, this is going to include the whole community of Azusa. So if we're going to start fresh, we should start fresh. That's how I feel. Board member Greer. So one, let me, I'll, I'll push back on, on uh, both board member Rodriguez Pena and, and board president, just with this thought. If, as we look at res the resources that we have, I think we have to ask ourselves the, the cost, as we assess the cost associated with rebranding, and we look at something like uh, board president a moment ago, we talk about a, a swimming pool. If we were, if we're looking at, we can't have it all, like are we gonna have a swimming pool or are we gonna, re gonna rebrand? And maybe that's not a good example because of the cost of a swimming pool, but, but in essence to, to, to rebrand, it comes at a cost of other things. And so I think we just have to ask ourselves, um, do, would, we, would we forego upgrades and improvements in other areas for the sole purpose of rebranding? And that's a, that would be, that would be difficult for me to fully get behind, uh, depending upon what those numbers were. You know, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think we have a community to answer to. And I, I neither did say that, that I wanted a rebranding or that I didn't want a rebranding. What I'm saying is, I think it's important that we get, that we ask our community, that we ask our parents, our, 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 our students, because we are going to display some students. I think it is important that we include them in this moving forward. This is. How would that be done, this, Mr. Thing? Well, we did do a survey. And again, in all fairness, one of the questions was not should we rebrand re it? Uh, but rebranding did come up in the survey um, analysis uh, through the open-ended. And so we do have data uh, that was um, organized and synthesized uh, for us. And if we just do a quick look at that, um, I think most of, most of what you will see is not in favor of rebranding. Now, again, just in, this was not a question about rebranding, right? This was, and most of, if you, if you see it, um, most of it is centered around cost. Like, why would we spend this money? Uh, and then there are some, um, I think, to some about uh, if we rename, then that's the, the whole thing about the alumni and, and tradition. Um, there's some of that as well. Mr. Mall, do you have the your memo on the rebranding cost? I can pull that up right now. I have it up. Um, Share it on the screen. Uh, yes. Let me share that one real quick. Um, a little bigger. Yes, ma'am. Now, um, if I'm not mistaken, this was for the middle school, and I think there. this is the high school here. Correct. Starting right there. $1.8 million. Well, no. It's not one point eight for rebranding. It's, correct. That's everything included at the high school. Yeah. So so two thirty five, dollars just for, for, for rebranding, one ten dollars for the turf overlay, right? So it's not the whole, the whole uh, field, but we do need to redo the the turf overlay, um, and then possible athletic equipment and or, uh, you know, uniforms, uh, band, and, and all that. Um, again, these are just um, projections, but... At one high school, or were you talking about... Um, this is one high school. In the, okay, so then the middle school... We'd have to double that. Same. Double Correct. that, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So to be clear, this this table, new branding is the logos on the sides of buildings, the marquee, 
sort of the the the, the sign, right? The gym floor, it's the taking up the parquet and having a new logo on the hardwood floor, right? Because we and we just put in new floors. Is that correct? No. The correction, the gym floor is including the logo and a new gym floor. Both gym floors need to be um, modernized. What did we modernize at Gladstone High School? And it was it bleachers? It was bleachers. bleachers. But it was both high floor? schools, not the floors. Okay. So, so just so to be clear, you're talking at removing lockers and kitchen. Those are the only two. It's around one. It's about one point two million per high school. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 2.4 for two sites? Potentially. So I'll just add again, um, now that we're actually looking at some of those numbers, I, it makes me uncomfortable to look at spending $2.4 million for the purposes of rebranding because that, that, you know, in order to do that, we are foregoing substantive upgrades to facilities on, on across the, across the district. Yeah, now that I see the numbers, yeah, I, I do. I don't think that financially that we should um, spend that on, on the two high schools and we couldn't use it in other um, programs or repair. Because I know, I do know, like I said, we're going to have unforeseen things that need to be done. Um, just like we did the last time. We should use that money on, on that. And just for clarity, um, I, I, would, I would say that it's 1.8. Um, the 2.4 is we're adding the gym floors and the gym floors um, we are proposing whether they're with the new logo or with the old logo. That's probably something that we should look at redoing because they need to be redone. So if we just take the new branding, the 235, the, the overlay, uh, which is a 110, so call it 350 plus the 500, 850 times two, the so 1.6, 1.7. I'm, I'm sorry. I would also like to throw in the locker room. If you've walked into Gladstone's locker room, or Asus, those are ancient. Like a, a thousand percent. We, we would still need, you know. And then as we're as we're looking forward to, um, we would like. I mean, Asus High would need some lights for Friday night lights as well. I mean, it's we can if we're going to stay with, you know, if we're not going to go rebranding. And you've already said the data speaks for itself. There's other possibilities that you know we 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 can upgrade our our high school and make it a state of the art school competing with our surrounding district but, but even at Glasson high school though you would still have to change high school right in, the word high school ma yes ma'am so in, like in on the, the marquees, marquees and, and on some of the and, paintings but wherever there's just a local g we can keep that but anywhere that has the word high school printed yes ma'am that would have to be changed. would it be changed to middle school if um, that was the desire right. of the board yes yeah. ma'am So it seems like the majority um, would like to go ahead and not go with the rebranding. Yes. Right. But yes. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I'm hearing. And so superintendent um, cabinet, that's what the board has decided is to keep the names of Azusa High School and Gladstone Middle School. It would be changed to Blackstone yeah. Middle School. So the as we're looking for um, as we're looking into the mascots board, would you like to go ahead and continue with the same mascots? Since the I think it makes sense to keep the same mascot, right? Because they they have their the gladiators on there and the aspects on that is the high work. And I, I see the majority, so that would be the same. As we're moving forward with, with this here, um, and we're making us just the high, um, the high school and Gladstone High School into the middle school and keeping the name and keeping the mascot. One of the things that I would like to go ahead and um, would like, um, is, is, as we're looking into the programs, right? Some of these programs, such as, and I'm just throwing this out there, I, I don't know 
if it's like the baseball team, right, at Estusa High or, or Gladstone, uh, the football team, band, poor band. They, their, their outfits are like they're old. I mean, that's something that we also need to invest in. As you no, know, they just got them. They just got them. Who got? Was it Gladstone? Azusa has um, a couple of years ago has new uniform. And okay. I'm not sure about Gladstone. Yeah, not not about but we're going to have a middle school band. So that's something also too, you know, looking at those programs, being able to invest in with this reconfiguration, being able to invest in these programs that they have adequate equipment, that they have added, you know, uniform our students deserve this any more comments on the middle school and high school board member Bo? i'm looking at our next couple of meetings mr mall how quickly can you pull together a five-year projected budget based on just the changes we've talked about so consolidated middle school consolidated one one comprehensive high school, um, and add in line adding in line items for some of these specialized programs that we have on the cost of considerations. Adding in transportation, um, what does that timeline look like to look at a five year projected budget? I think that's that's the next piece. That you know we're getting consensus around big parts of programs and some of the site. Where does that land us? I'm just to make sure I understand. So we're saying for me to identify all the plans and costs that we will need, and then you want me to divide that over the next five years to obtain it, or am I just well, what is what is the five-year projected budget? I, uh, the, the district's operating budget, assuming all of these changes happen July first. Okay. I think I'm not following. I'm sorry. If you could say it a different way. So. Um, when you present us the budget, we look at our three-year budget. So we look at the current year, year is year one, year two is the next year, year three is the following year, when you do the the, the first interim and the second mm -hmm. interim, right? Yeah. So I'm asking for that kind of presentation with a five, instead of three-year, a five-year. I mean, we're, we're looking at, we're, we're entering into this conversation about school organization. One major consideration is fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So as we make these changes to sites, and staffing and programs, we have to be grounded in what's our budget going to look like in five years. Are we going to be able to sustain these programs that we're talking about? So based on our current funding, I can give you a five-year budget. We have a, a actually a six-year MYP already drafted. So is that what you'd like me to show? But that would not account for any planned expenditures because right now we would plan to use that as a bond funding. Let me try to say it a different way. Uh, so. We have a six year MIP that's based on our current situation right now with 17 schools, right? But now we know that there's going to be only one high school and one middle school. How does that affect the six year MIP? Because now we don't have two high schools and three middle schools. Is that correct? Yes. And you know, we've looked at some big line items like whether it's 2.5 or 2.8 for transportation. I mean, we haven't talked about transportation in detail, but that's a number that should be incorporated into this to see what it looks like, if that's that, the highest, most conservative projection for transportation. And then adding in some of these other costs, for example, for continuing with dual immersion, for implementing the IB at an elementary and at the middle school. So these costs are already identified, but layering them into the projection. So it would be helpful, and this is just me speaking, um, so we're not overstating to truly identify what schools will be closing, so I can also count that as a savings. Otherwise, I would just be saying, okay, these are the costs that we need right now for these two schools, but everything else will remain whole, and I don't think that's what our plan is. So I don't want to overstate and give um, inflated numbers, but if I knew exactly how many schools will be remaining, even if we just say there will be X number of elementary, we know there's one middle, there's one high school, then we can look at staffing. I would have to work in collaboration with Jorge to say, okay, what will be the savings of staffing? What will be the savings on programs? How much would we have to invest in each program that we're identifying? 
So I can get that, but I don't have enough information at this time to produce that. I think it's in our best interest then as a board to to have that conversation right now. I mean, we're asking, you know, we're, we're, this is what we have two more meetings and that's it. So I think it's in our best interest to talk about these. So one of the things that um, that we're looking into it is uh, that we decided is not to have a secret state. At least we know that. Um, <clears throat> one of the thing, one of the um, we have uh, we have two elementaries um, here, which is uh, a sec. Because uh, I only see one elementary. We have two, which is Ellington and Lee. And just as, again, just context, the reason there's Ellington and Lee there, this came from the school reorganization team. That's the only reason. Right. That, that, that's that's yes. what I was um, so the, looking at this, right? So, is need a, is need a minute? Or member Greer? Yeah, so I, I would, I recognize that this is what came forward, um, you know, from the from the reorganization team. But ev again, every person who I've spoken to who is a part of the reorganization team, though they were complicit in the final result, I've heard no one uh, express that they were, you know, extremely excited about the, about the model entirely. With that being said, um, I really think it's incumbent on us as a as a board to to do what we can to ensure that we're not kicking this can down the road so that five years later, ten years later, we're we're needing to have this conversation again when we have the the data that already communicates what's what's coming down um, you know the, the, the pike here. With with that being said, with as we currently have. Uh, LA, two, two schools that are on, on the list it puts us at a at a i guess i don't have the final numbers because we have to make make some adjustments but it, it puts us in the low 70s um if, if i'm not mistaken the low low 70s in regards to capacity and that will just continue to decrease as time goes goes on i think that there's that, that we need to seriously consider at least at least one additional elementary school that we would consolidate um as well um, so that we're not we're not needing to revisit this or, or put it on to the next iteration of the board to revisit this in X number of years. I'd like to revisit my my previous request about the the assets at each site, so looking at the number of classrooms, the auxiliary spaces, and also the acreage. So when when I look at um, a district map, I'm looking at schools in the north, the south, the east, the west, looking at if we are consolidating to something like a seven, to, to, to reach 70, 75, 80% capacity, how do we ensure that we have room to grow in 20 years when enrollment comes back? And that's why I wanted to ask about acreage, right? What would be our capacity to build up or to add portables or to build out on some of the larger sites? And that's something that I like to have a better understanding of before looking at just seat capacity per campus. And maybe Mr. Ortega or anyone here, if you have a sense of which are the larger campuses, so not just from a seat perspective, but which are the, the camp elementary campuses that have more land? Are there campuses that are landlocked where we could not expand? Are there campuses where we could expand? Board member, but you're also talking about the field, correct? Where we can put portables and so forth, right? Okay.
I mean, just as a quick reaction, I think um, we are very blessed uh, that our schools uh, are large, are on large properties. I'm trying to think off the top of my head right now. Um, I mean, every school that I think of, I'll, I mean, we have, I mean, they are, they're, in terms of land, um, we are very fortunate that we do have uh, big uh, parcels of land. Again, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to run through the elementary schools right now. And every elementary school that I can think of has ginormous amounts of land. And they do. I can testify to that. I've been to every school site and to yeah. their outside activities. And we have plenty. I mean, of if space. a student goes and plays, you might lose them. They're, they're so far <laughs> at the other end. I mean, seriously. I mean, all the schools, they're like, they're, they're huge. So that's one lens, and I'd still like to see the the numbers. All the lens, and they're and, all like. And the second lens is, what's the status of modernization at our elementary school? Are there some schools that have been more modernized? Are there schools that have had zero modernization? So as we choose sites to remain open and invest in, or sites that we've recently installed or upgraded, what does that look like? So one of the questions was asked if we did modernization at, at the elementary. So I know that for a fact we did Magnolia. There was some at Hodge. Um, and so the there's just um, Foothill had a full-on makeover, full uh, brand new uh, PE locker room from scratch. Um, so there's a lot of, the, I know that there's um, there's documentation where everything you, what, which I've seen it before. Um, where there is doc, uh, data shows um, what has been done at every school, what is what you know what is the potential um, uh, modernization they're waiting for, and so they're, they're and that is true. And then for most of our elementaries, um, their modernization included underground utilities, um, HVAC, so not so much of the aesthetics. Um, some could have been roofing, um, but with that, I would I mean I will still provide the report, but all of our facilities need to be upgraded. All of our facilities need to be modernized. So no matter what school we select, it will be at the point that they all would have to be touched at this time. One of the things that I, I, I wanted to, to bring up was, um, you know, one of the projections that uh, has um, led us to where we are now right, is the birth rate. So people are not having six to 10 kids like my family, right? Or even four kids nowadays. You're not having four kids. I have four kids. We have four kids, right? But we're the exception. As we look forward to, I, I think it's, um, you know, as we look forward to and we look at this projection, right? One of the things that I heard you say, uh, board member Bo, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you would like to keep not go to a, um, three elementaries because the possibility of of um, you know, uh, birth or, or or having the extra room for additional for it for something that we may need, right? Growth, growth. I'd there like to consider. You know what is our target? If 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 board member agree, if if seventy is seventy percent capacity, you feel is too low. What is the right number? And how many schools? You know, if we close one more elementary school, would that get to seventy five percent capacity? I mean, what does that look like incrementally? And and what is the cost savings we're trying to achieve? I remember last. One of my first board meetings, we looked at a projection, and I think it was at the time, looking out four years, we were going to go over a $13 million cliff. So is that what we're, that, that's what I'm trying to, to get to. So if, by making these changes, 
are we also ensuring that we're realizing the cost savings to do it? Um, yes. Yeah. So quick answer is yes. Um, so this will take a collaboration on, on all parts. Um, we would need to ensure that based on the school that we're closing, how are we eliminating staff? Um, we're being strategic about the staff that we are keeping is based to fill need or future program. So that would take, um, that's a comprehensive plan, but that is ultimately our goal. So one of the questions um, was that, what does what the projection look like if we were to go ahead and close three elementaries, right, instead of two? Right here, we're looking at two. And if we can identify which schools, then I can upgrade the capacity. Which one are you? Um, which one? 73.71% capacity. For model three. Yes, one TKA, but model three. One TK eight. Do we have a sense from other districts that have consolidated schools what what capacity they landed on? So on a low end, the percentage has always been 75%. Um, but when you start at 75% and you're a declining enrollment district, you're quickly going to drop beyond that. So the rule of thumb will be typically to try to get your um, school size to have a capacity of 85 um, percentage. So that way you can project out what uh, programs you're going to implement to attract students versus that decline coming right back to you and you're being below 75%. And the projection... Um we don't have it in front of us, but the projection in, in what is it, four years, our enrollment here in our district was going to be under, was it 4,000? I would have to get that. I don't believe it's that low, not 4,000. Ooh, don't low. scare me. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's too low in four years. Um, give me one Maybe second. Maybe a little more conservative. <laughs> 6,000. I'm going to share my screen if it's, if it's helpful. Uh, this is from an, um, a prior worksheet. And so if we wanted to, again, uh, punch in numbers, that this in a live manner uh, would change your capacity. But right now, this is the way it looks like uh, from the school reorganization team. Uh, so you see Ellington and Lee there um, at the at the bottom, um, but again, in a live manner, we could change these, change these around. And I think these are even older, older numbers. This is this is now that I'm looking at this. This was probably when we started. So if I was to update them um, on our on our ten year uh, demographic. Um, For president in four years, our projected enrollment is 6619. 6619? Six, six, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. That's looking at 2324. I guess that was three. So four in 2425, we're looking at 6421. Maybe this is not working. That's an old one. Oh. I tried. Sorry. <laughs>
Well, Mr. Ortega, would you be able to help us prepare that these worksheets with the different scenarios, with the, the current data, and looking at how we can get to 85% capacity? Yes. Board Member Greer? Yeah, that similar to that, that was going to be my question. If what if eighty five percent capacity was our target, then then what would that mean by way of school clo consolidations or, or or you know we have two that are on the list. Is that three three schools? Is that four schools um, that we're we're consolidating to others to get us at eighty five? Uh, that that would be helpful. That would be helpful to know to consider the the entire composition of, of school sites across the, the city. But if I I heard Ms. Latasha Jamal say she would like to know what schools is that correct? That would be helpful. Or option two is we can provide you um, the board options of what schools to remain open and maintaining 85% the best. Yes, to be work within the guidelines of what we've talked about, one high school, one middle school, those sites, no rebranding. Yeah. And then what are the, what puzzle pieces? So how do you have the least amount of change to achieve the 85% capacity? Like, and then putting, putting that name to it. Right. But then we look at this map and say, okay, that means but this. Do we need the to map. close another two or, or, or not or two more? I mean, we don't, right. To reach that 85%, what do we need to do? And that would be helpful to us to make that decision. Board Member Greer, did he have a hand up? He has that look like he wants to say something. No, no, that's, I, I said it in, in uh, Board Member uh, Rodriguez, you, you reiterated it. So that, those yeah. are my thoughts. Can I ask a clarifying question? And we're solely just options to maximize 85%. We're not looking east west, just to make sure I'm building yes. the request of the board, fulfilling the request of the board. I'm sorry, okay. east west. I just want to make sure that's not a factor. We're looking, Options, variable options where we have eighty five percent capacity and what that looks like. I think I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll chime in. I think I think we bring options that do bring so we can bring option one, eighty five percent. Now we have in all four quadrants of the city. Uh, option two, and, and so I think we can just bring different looks, and then we can also have a live sheet that we can manipulate live if we need to manipulate okay what if we what Helpful. if we just move this one school what would, what would that do i think that 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 is great having it live so that we can have a, a discussion and be able to put that up there one of the things that i i would like to ask the board is as 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 we're looking, right, we're looking now, now that we have decided the middle school, the high school where it's going to be at, one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves is, right now we have sixth grade at the elementaries, right? So we're, we're, what does that look like to do that transition, right, of moving the sixth graders to the middle school and phasing out center foothill? And Lawson. When you know what does that look like, and when can we make that transition? Like, what is the timeline? Right. In how what is the timeline? What, what does that look like? Transition. I mean, even the students from one high school to another high school, the middle schools to one high school. You know, is it going to take years or or? or I, I would. I would timeline? not like to. Right. I would not like to. I would like to see it phased. You know, phased out since we have our seventh and eighth grade this year, right? So for next year, what, what would happen to those seventh and eighth graders? And the Before we jump to that, can I, can I ask a question? I have my hand raised about the previous subject, the elementaries. Can we- Go ahead, uh, Board Member Cruz Gonzalez. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my, my question, Arturo, is, so I, I appreciate that we're gonna do some thinking about this and do some live thinking about it. My question is how much how much of this thinking has already been done and deliberated by the reorganization committee? And really how how can you can and I know you've already presented multiple times what what they've what they sort of landed on. So I'm just wondering how can we just be remind remind ourselves of all that 
effort that they already went through and the conclusions that they drew and why they drew those conclusions, right? Um, to help guide guide that, I guess, journey that we're going to have looking at, at different, op different options. Because it sounds to me like it's something that we, I mean, it sounds like very similar to what they already did. Yeah, and I think we can, as we build that, we can have that voice in our head. Obviously, there's a couple of things that we have changed here that that weren't in their plans. Uh, so TK5 is one, no TK8, uh, number two. Uh, but we can definitely keep that keep that voice uh, that we heard as these models uh, were being constructed um, by the members. Board Member Greer. I have uh, two comments, one going back uh, to, to what Shilini just referenced and, and another one going forward. So, so going, going back to just the composition of, of, of uh, elementary schools and the potential 85% target or 85% or as a target, um, I, I, would, I would really hope that staff would be able to, instead of merely looking at schools and, and moving things around in such a way that, that just gets us to the 85 um, really looking at all of the different pieces and, and, and factors and, and in essence, bring forward um, a, a recommendation with rationale. So, uh, so based off of uh, the, the, some of the costs and what's known with, with upgrades that are needed at school campuses or based on where, where school sites are located or ba you know, based on some of these different things that we've talked around a little bit. So, in, so instead of merely coming forward and just move, eliminating a school because it gets us to 85, but but actually doing some of that thinking as a starting point, not an ending point, but as a starting point for us to continue the conversation. Um, and then the second thing I would I would throw out there as we're talking about implementation. So this might be crazy, and this this might make this might make staff go crazy. Um, but I would I would hope that we would look at no more than a two year implementation. Uh, of uh, with with all these different changes that that we're doing, I would hope that it, it could be done with no more than a two year. And and the only reason why I say two year and, and not a one year implementation is because I realize that it's November 9th, twenty twenty one, and and there are just things that that need to get done. But um, I hope yeah, we're not pushing this into three and, and four years of of a rollout. Board Member Greer, I'm asking a clarifying question. When you say two year, are you talking about twenty two, twenty three, twenty three, twenty four? That when we start the 25 year, this is completely done. Need to do my math here. Um, <laughs> I, so yeah, that's a good question. I, I suppose what would it look like for 20? 20, 20, He's saying um, 22, 23, I'm, 23, 24. That's two years. Yeah, correct. So, and the starting in, in the fall of 24, right? That, e that even feels like an upper end. I guess I'm, I guess I'm wondering what would it look like 20, what is that then, 23, 24 um, for, for an implementation as opposed to 24, 23. Okay. As one voice. Right, and back to my question was, you know, what does that look like, right? Would, would two years be, you know, sufficient? Um, it's one of these things that I, I think it's it's important that um, you, you know. For example, I, ha I had a couple parents call me today and, and say, "Hey, so when you guys decided to make the one high, you know, one middle school, she asked, my daughter's in fourth grade. So in two years, where is she going to go? That, that that's that's an honest question. It, parents want to know, so I think it's important that." we are able to, to have that timeline ready for our parents to, to know where their kids are. You know, how are we getting a transition? How are we going to make this transition? Um, are, are we going to, when, when do we, I, the elementaries are, I think are a little bit easier, right? But with the high school and the middle school, that's going to take some planning. Are we going to use Foothill Middle School as a, you know, as a layover at, are we going to use another elementary as a layover for the seventh and eighth as we're doing this transition? Those are, you know, questions that the community has. Board President, can we ask staff as they look at the capacity numbers 
to also outline an implementation plan Absolutely. and for us to do, for them to do the deep thinking around, okay, when we move this, it has impact here. What that looks like, you know, over a, what would happen, for example, what changes would be in effect July 1, 2022, and what changes would be in effect July 1, 2023? As we stand, what does that look like? Right. I'd like to be able to digest and react to that proposal. Absolutely. I would agree. And staffing too. What does that look like for our staff? Because that also will impact our our employees. Well, it looks like we had a lot to to converse about. We had real talk. And I appreciate my colleagues here tonight, um, whether on Zoom or here in person, about being able to have this conversation. It's important and it should be a priority at this point. And I thank you guys for watching, all of you guys that are watching, listening as we are processing. As, as you guys know, we don't talk about these things until we come to the dais. So I don't know what my colleagues are thinking. And therefore, it's literally a raw conversation. And I appreciate my colleagues for this time that we have allowed ourselves to have this special meeting. And I look forward to continuing um, our, this conversation with the information that we have requested and have provided uh, that you guys will provide for us. I, I just want to um, just want to um, just throw it out there that board colleagues, if if we feel that we still need more information, I I. I think it's important that we do take our time to process and like you said, digest because this, it, it's going to have a domino effect. And one of the things to consider is how is this going to affect this? How is that going to affect that? And if we have a conversation here with cabinet board all together, right? I, it, it doesn't create that unexpected, oh, well, we're going to, you know, uh, do a $1.2 million dollar dollar uh, parking lot here at Gladstone, uh, former Gladstone, um, you know, um, what is it, field, right, at the elementary, right. So these these are good conversations that we're having. And I, and I thank you, Cabinet, for writing all your notes down as we're processing and requesting and asking all these questions all at once, because I know that we're asking a lot of questions and for a lot of things. So thank you for that. And you know, for being on this journey with us, because this is a journey. And for you guys too at home, for all of you guys listening, this is our journey. We're in this together. So before uh, moving on to our next item, does anyone have anything else they would like to ask for cabinet? Yeah, I, I would just like to ask cabinet is, are there, are there any additional clarifying questions that you, that you might have? Um, or, or, or do, do you feel uh, full, fully in, prepared and informed enough to, to take the next steps? Because because you all got a lot of homework from this meeting. Um, I think I think we have enough clarity, but I also um, would never um, stop myself or ourselves from seeking clarity if we get to a point where the chicken scratches look like, wait, was this, this, or this? And then just reaching out and say, hey, just for clarity, um, you know, is this what we were talking about? I think that's, um, we, we, we definitely can do that if we get to a, a point uh, where we feel stuck or, or, or not clear. Well, you have our number, Superintendent Ortega. And your addresses. Oh, yeah, you know where we live, too. <laughs> Thank you. 
thank everyone. I want to thank the reorganization committee that really got this all started. Um, that really helped us out and also the cabinet for working so hard and getting the figures um, for us. And I, I know it's a lot of work, but I, we really appreciate because it's a very hard decision. And I think we really need to ask these questions and have the information in order for us also to make the right decision for this community. One more thing I would like to just uh, thank all my colleagues today for their questions. And I, I, I think um, we're, as we work together, in a collaborative way towards this, I think we will reach much better results. And so I thank you for that. Seeing that there's no more questions or comments, I will go ahead and move on to our next item, actually our last item of the night, which is item 5.1, our adjournment. Can I please get a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Go ahead, Yolanda. I make a motion to adjourn 5.1. And I second. I have a first by board member Rodriguez Pena. I have a second by board member Bo. And are we all logged in? Oh. And let's go ahead and do our hand vote. Board member Greer. Yes. Board member Cruz Gonzalez. Yes. Board member Rodriguez Pena, board member Bo, yes, and myself, yes, five zero. We are done. Have a great night. We'll see you guys at our next board meeting.